Good morning. It is good to see y'all this Sunday morning, and good that uh, y'all are around and fellowshipping, and uh, we're certainly glad to see that. Nothing like the body of Christ fellowshipping and catching up on uh, all that's taken place this past week, and uh, we'll continue to ask the Lord to lead in God, and we keep up with Him uh, in the days ahead as well, making sure, as uh, I think Henry Blackaby said, that we need to be about what the Lord's doing and know what he's about, and uh, it's not necessarily what we think we need to do. It's more important to be and understand and look and see where the Lord's working and be a part of that work, and I'm so thankful for a church that does that. I want us to stand together as we uh, read God's Word together this morning. Uh, we're going to take a look at Philippians. We're going to take a look at chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. So uh, if you take a moment and let's read that together. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity, and when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even to death on the cross." For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's sing about that name of Christ. proclaim your name. What a great day to honor you with every ounce of being we have. Lord, we thank you for the breath that you've given us to do so. We thank you, Lord, for the energies that you have given us to proclaim your name and to give you all glory and honor and praise for what will take place here and in our lives. And this morning, as we have just sung, Father, may truly we hail the power of your name. May we truly hail the power that you had over sin death, hell, and the grave. And Father, may we continue 
to praise your name and hail the power of your name that holds all things together, including the body of Christ universal and the body uh, here at Northlake. Father, may you continue to keep us unified and hold things together as we seek to honor you. In thy name we pray. Amen. Let's sing. Here we go. Reve, I praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus, who thy hand is now.
morning as we enter to our time of congregational prayer. Um, it's a very special weekend, very special day tomorrow that we honor the men and women who have uh, put their lives on the line, who continue to put their lives on the line for us. Uh, we honor our veterans. So this morning as we focus in on our prayer time, I want to focus in on our military, uh, those who are active, those who are inactive, I also want to focus in on our government. We have big changes coming in the new year. Uh, but I also want our church to be recognized that regardless of who won the presidential election, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Amen. And the focus of the church doesn't change. In fact, as I was praying Wednesday morning, my quiet time thinking about the results of the election, one of the things I prayed for, there's two things I prayed for. One is I prayed that President Trump would have men and women around him, godly men and women who would have his ear, but most importantly, that the God of the universe would have his heart. But on top of that, I prayed for the church. I prayed for our church, and I prayed for the church in general because many of us may feel like, okay, the election went perhaps the way we wanted it, and we feel like we, we're, we're in a safe place. We don't have to worry about religious persecution from the government and we might get complacent our mission does not change our mission does not change to be light in a dark world our mission does not change to be salt in a world that needs perseverance needs preserving and needs seasoning we are to be that church and we will continue to be that church regardless of who is in charge but we are commanded in Scripture to pray for our leaders, to make sure that we hold them in prayer, that God has ordained our leaders to be who they are, where they are, when they are. And we trust that God has everything in control because we believe in a sovereign God who is King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. So this morning, I invite you to join me if you want to come to the altar you're welcome to. But join me in prayer as we pray for our government. We pray for the current administration, the incoming administration, and for our veterans. Heavenly Father, this morning we come before you as a grateful people. Lord, we come before you because you're a God who remains the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There's not a, an election that will ever take you away from being who you are, being God Almighty. And as followers of Jesus, we rest in that fact alone. That our hope is built on nothing less than on the cornerstone, Christ Jesus. 
This morning, Father, it's our prayer as a church that you would anoint and protect President-elect Trump, President-elect Vance, and their entire team as they prepare to come into the White House and into the Senate for those who are the new senators and new House representatives. We pray your protection upon them, that no evil would come against them. But God, I pray that no evil would be in their hearts. That Lord, you would give us a majority of men and women who have their ear and their eyes affixed to you, to you and your spirit, that you have a hold of their heart. And God, they would lead justly, they would lead rightly, they would lead fairly, and they would lead knowing that they are accountable to you. Father, I pray for the current administration, the last couple of months they have left. Lord, I pray your protection upon them. I pray that you would protect them from evil as well. That God, over the last, next two months, God, they would lead well and that things would transition well. Lord, I pray that for our state house. I pray that for our state legislature. I pray that for our local um, uh, politicians, mayors, and parish uh, county leaders and all this stuff. God, I pray over all of them that, God, you would protect, lead, and guide. God, I pray for the church. That, God, we would be more motivated to follow Jesus. We'd be more motivated to share the hope of Jesus. We'd be more motivated to see people's lives change because of Jesus, not because of an election, but because of Jesus. And Father, finally, I lift up our veterans. Thank you for men and women who made the choice to serve in our armed forces. For those who are currently serving, that God, your protection would be upon them. For those who have retired or have been discharged out, God, that you would be over them. Lord, so many have come home with physical ailments that continue to ravage their bodies. Some have come home with mental and emotional illnesses that continue to ravage their minds and make life difficult every day. Lord Jesus, I pray for a supernatural miracle on these men and these women. That God, even today, Lord, their minds would be at rest, their hearts would be at peace, their bodies would ache just a little bit less. And that, Lord, they would know that you have touched them, that you have given them this respite from their injuries that you have brought healing to their bodies I thank you that you're a God who's still in the healing business that you are merciful to us and that you love us this morning Father as we continue our study of how we are to act around the table how we who have been invited to the table how we're supposed to act because of that invitation God would you pierce our hearts where we are failing you God would you motivate us to Lord be obedient to you so that God we can be a proper reflection of the gospel to others and it's in Jesus' name that I pray Amen Let's stand together as we look at all the things that the world tosses out I want to remind you there is really only one gospel and that gospel is designed to unify us as brothers and sisters in Christ and unify our relationship with him. So let's sing out, There Is One Gospel. There is one gospel on which I stand for all eternity. It is my story, my Father's plan. The Son has rescued me. Oh, what a gospel, oh, what a peace. My highest joy and my deepest need. Now and forever, He is my life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. to which I cling, all else I count as lost. For there where justice and mercy meet, he saved me on the cross. And no more I boast in what I can bring, no more I carry the weight of sin. For he has brought me from death to life. I stand in the garden. 
got your Bibles. Philippians chapter 1 is where we'll be. We'll be in there and in chapter 2 uh, this morning. So we've kind of moved to a new stage of the table series. We've spent the last four weeks talking about what the table is. Uh, we've talked about who's at the table. We've talked about the tablecloth of grace that covers all of us. But now it's time to talk about how do we who are invited to sit at the table, those who are in Christ, how do we live? Uh, because so much of the Christian life is the life we have from when we're justified in Christ to whenever we become glorified in Christ. And we call that in between time our sanctification period, the period where we are becoming, hopefully, more and more like Jesus. And if you're like me, there are times in your life where you look at your life, you're like, wow, I'm doing really good at this whole sanctification thing. And there's times you look at your life, and you're like, I am terrible at this whole sanctification thing. But here's the thing. Regardless of whether you feel like you're growing quickly or you're growing slowly, you're growing. And I want to encourage you in that, that you may look at some people and say, wow, I, I, don't, I don't have a walk with the Lord like they do. Are you walking with the Lord? That's my primary question. If you are, then let's trust the Holy Spirit to work in your life. Let's trust that God is shaping you and moving you and putting you in a place that he wants you to be at so that you can be the most effective follower of Jesus that there can be. Now look, when we think about table manners, it's kind of the the subtitle, if you will, of the table series that we're in now. Table manners. So I, I looked up online table manners. Now there's lots of information if you want to know about table manners. And I, I found one website that had the top 10 table manners. And so in case you weren't aware what those are, I'm going to give those to you this morning. And so maybe for some of you, this is going to be like, yep, I knew it all. For others, this may help you next time you're at a meal, maybe at lunch today. You can perhaps put some of these into practice if you need to. First of all, chew with your mouth closed. (laughs) Here's one. Here's a modern day one, right? Keep your smartphone off the table and set to silent or vibrate. Wait to check calls and texts until you're finished 
with the meal and always away from the table. I'm guilty. Gosh, like that thing is like my brain. And I, I'm one of those people that like, I'm always working. I'm always thinking. I'm always doing something. It used to drive my wife crazy. When we were, uh, the first time around, we were at Calvary in New Orleans. I was the administrative executive pastor. And so my job on Sunday was to make sure everything ran the right way. And so I'd pull my Blackberry out. That's aging me right there. I'd pull my Blackberry out, and I'm constantly making notes. And she'd look at me. She goes, what are you doing? And she goes, I make, I'm, I'm making notes for staff meeting tomorrow. She goes, you need to pay attention. I said, I'll listen to the replay. I've got to make these notes, right? I'm always working, always thinking. I came back from doing uh, one of my interims, and we're at Christmas and uh, at Calvary, and uh, the Christmas production is going on. It's great. I've had, I pulled my iPhone out, and I'm starting talking. She goes, "Who are you texting?" I'm not texting anybody. She goes, "What are you doing?" I'm making notes. She goes, "You don't work here anymore." I'm like, "Yeah, but he's going to call me and ask me." And sure enough, the next morning, the pastor called and asked me. So, but at the dinner table, try to limit the smartphone use. Um, number three, hold utensils correctly. Don't use your fork or spoon like a shovel or to stab your food. There you go. Um, wash up and come to the table clean. Don't groom or attend hygiene at the table. Uh, that goes also uh, for, for the table here. We don't need you washing your hair in the middle of the worship service either. So come, come clean, but, uh, but try to do that. Uh, remember to use your napkin. Uh, don't use the tablecloth. That's not what it's there for. Um, wait until you're done chewing or to sip or swallow a drink. There you go. Uh, pace yourself with fellow diners. Cut only one piece of food at a time. I'm a quick, anybody else quick eaters? I'm a quick eater. And so there's times when I, I just eat and all of a sudden people are like still eating their salad and I'm done. I'm, it just, it happens. So that's a good thing. Uh, avoid slouching and don't place your elbows on the table while eating. Although it is okay to prop your elbows on the table while conversing between courses. Okay, apparently this has always been a thing. I know my parents are like, no, no elbows on the table, never. But apparently if you're, you know, in between courses and you're just having general conversation, it's okay. Uh, instead of reaching across the table for something, ask for it to be passed to you. And the last one is, bring your best self to the meal. Take part in the dinner conversation. It's always awkward whenever you're having a meal with someone and there's just total silence. Now, it's okay for a period of time where everybody's eating, but if there's just silence the entire meal, it's a little awkward. So it's always good that when you gather with friends and family for a meal, and you know there's a, little, there's a day coming up here at the end of the month where people tend to do that, it's good to bring your best self to have good conversation while you're there. Now, there are certain expectations for dining and for manners depending on where you're eating and with whom you're eating with. Obviously, if you're going over to the Dairy Queen to have a blizzard with some friends, it's one thing to do that as opposed to going to a fine steakhouse and having a meal. The requirements, the expectation for the dining decor, or decorum, I should say, is different. Around Jesus' table, there are expectations that he has for us as well to follow. Uh, so this morning, we're going to expand our look at what are the table manners that we should have as followers of Jesus? Now, in Philippians 1 is where we're going to be at, and we're going to spend time there in chapter 2. But let me give you some background on Philippians. So Paul is writing this letter from prison, all right? Uh, the church in Philippi was made up of primarily Gentile Christians, and they were proud of their Roman citizenship. These people love being Roman citizens. In fact, historians have uh, told us that the, the town of Philippi, the city of Philippi, was one of Rome's most special outlets. It was one of those places that was very patriotic. They were, they were uber Roman citizens. They enjoyed everything there was about being a Roman. But as Paul writes to them, he puts an emphasis, a focus on a different type of citizenship, one that has an eternal value, their heavenly citizenship, their place around God's table. And this morning, I am probably looking at a room full of people, and a room full of people online are looking at me, of people who are very proud to be American citizens. No, we realize our country is not perfect, but 
It's the best thing going in all the world when it comes to living in a place. People want to come here way more than they want to leave. And those who say they want to leave never leave. Right? And so the reality is this, is that we should be very proud to be American citizens. But let me also say as the church, we have a citizenship that trumps our American citizenship. That we are followers of Jesus before we were followers or citizens of America. That while we love and cherish and honor our country to the, to the most extreme measure that we can, it never surpasses our citizenship in heaven. Because at your death, your citizenship in, on earth in America ends. If down the road, for whatever, in God's sovereignty, if God chooses to allow this wonderful country to be occupied by another country, we may lose our citizenship as Americans. But our citizenship in heaven is eternal. It is given to us by God, not at our discretion to take or to leave, but at His sole invitation to bring us to the table and to secure us with His Holy Spirit. So the question is, now how shall we live? If we are citizens of heaven, how shall we live in the midst of this country that we love dearly, in the midst of this world that we're called to be salt and light in? So if you'll join me in Philippians chapter 1, we're going to read verse 27 into chapter 2, verse 4 to begin. Just one thing. As citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whatever, when it, when, then whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I will hear about you, that you're standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel not being frightened in any way by your opponents. This is a sign of destruction for them, but of your salvation. And this is from God. For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I have. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affliction and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interest, but rather to the interest of others. If you're a parent of small children, or if you parented small children, do you remember the time that you sat your kids down and had the conversation the first time you ever took them to a sit-down restaurant? And you're like, listen, we're about to take you to wherever, Outback, Texas Roadhouse, wherever. Or maybe even a nicer place. Maybe there's a family gathering at one of these really nice restaurants. And you sit your children down and you begin to say, these are the expectations that we have of you. You will not run around the restaurant like you run around this house. The booth or the chair that we sit in is not like your bed that you jump up and down on. The people sitting around us are not your friends. Please don't talk to them. They're there to enjoy their meal too. Now, I will say that as I've gotten older, I kind of enjoy the kids who are next to you. They kind of talk to you. It's kind of fun. The parents are all freaking out, and I'm just making faces at them and waving at them and stuff. It's a lot of fun. But when my kids were younger, I did not want my kids doing that. I had all the fears in the world that my kids were just going to make a total mess of everything. Even to this day, when I take my 20-year-old children out, I still have to sometimes remind them of how to act. <laughs> Y'all pray for me. I can't sit down at a meal without looking up and my daughters have undone their straw paper and then blow it straight in my face. Doesn't matter what kind of restaurant we're at. They'll do it. Y'all pray for them. They need the Lord. Um, but listen, but look, the reason I bring that up is that Paul begins 
his message to us today with the very same thing. He's like, church, let me sit you down and let me explain to you the expectation. And it's this, live your life worthy of the gospel. Live your life worthy of the gospel. In my 18 years I spent at Tulane as their athletics chaplain, every season, both in football and baseball, I would kind of have the same message to kick off. And it was a reminder of you play for both the people that's on your chest, but also the name on your back. That you're not just playing for yourself, but there are people that have an expectation that you will play well, that you will behave appropriately. And and Paul kind of does the same thing here. He's like, listen, I want you to know that as you're out living your life, as you are doing your very best to live out the things of Jesus, do so in a way that is worthy of the gospel. Live your life, have, have an attitude, have attributes, have characteristics of someone who has been changed by Jesus Christ. I think sometimes we believe that our only times that we should act like Jesus is when we're in the church house on Sunday or on Wednesday. But the rest of the time, we can kind of push those things away or we can dilute those things a little bit and we can live like someone else or live like we are someone else. But our call is every day to live worthy of the gospel. So the question is, how do we do that? What are some characteristics that we can apply to our life that will help us do that? And over the next few weeks this month, that's what we're going to look at. And this morning, there are two that I want to focus in on in this passage that I hope will help us have a better understanding of our responsibility both together as a body, but individually as we go about our daily lives. So table manner number one is unity. And the first thing about unity that I see in this passage is that a unified table, a unified church has a primary purpose. Has a primary purpose. In verse 27, Paul gives some specific things that he says we should do that should be our purpose. He said, first, stand firm in one spirit. There is one spirit that should be leading this church. And that spirit is called the Holy Spirit. The God, the Spirit given to each believer is the one that leads the church. It is my responsibility as the pastor of the church to seek the leading of the Holy Spirit when it comes to the preaching and teaching of God's Word. That as I put together the the preaching plan and as I pray through the passages that that God leads me to teach through, that everything that I do and everything that I say should be driven by my prayer time and my, my abiding with Christ and listening to the Spirit. That also goes for each and every one of you, and it goes for you if you're watching this morning and you're in Christ. That it, that's not just a pastor thing to be led by the Spirit, but it's an everyday follower of Jesus thing to be led by the Spirit. And we do that by being in God's Word, by allowing God to speak to us through His Word. And then when He speaks, we trust that He's spoken to us, and then we become obedient to what He tells us to do. But a unified table, a table has a primary purpose. It has to be unified in the Spirit. But He also says, or to stand firm in one accord. So there's one spirit that leads us. And then when we have a mission and we have a vision, we stand together under that. And we don't let a high chair or an armchair tell us what to do. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and watch last Sunday's sermon. If you want to, fast forward to the end, because that's when I talk about that. But the high chair Christian is the one who is me-focused and not we-focused. And the armchair person is the one who sits outside who's not invited to the table but believes he or she should tell the table how they should act and what they should do. We ignore both of these. We call them both into repentance. 
This one for their salvation. This one because they've become very self-centered and not spirit-centered and not God-centered. But neither one of these we listen to because why? We will be in one accord in vision and in mission. We will be a church that makes disciples who makes disciples. We will be a church that strives to abide in Christ in all that we do. We will be a church that will be grace-driven. We will be a church that are citizens of heaven above citizens of anything or anywhere else. Why? Because the Scriptures demand that of us. Christ has commanded that of us. And so we will do so in one accord. We will do so lockstep, not because I said so, because it really doesn't matter what I believe. What matters is what God has said on the issue. And he has made it very, very clear. So we're in one accord. We're led by the Spirit. But we're also contending together for the gospel. We're contending together for the gospel. It is the gospel or bust. It is not my goal to raise up people who vote like me. It is not my goal to go after people who cheer for the same football team I cheer for. Please pray for my football team. Let's, we need to pray for all of our football teams probably this morning, except for the Reeds. They're happy this morning. But everybody else, you know, it was a rough day yesterday. But that's not my goal. My goal is to see the gospel of Jesus Christ transform the life of every person that I can come in contact with. That I would be so committed to to, to making gospel deposits in the lives of people to water and to spread the seed of the gospel that God would then sovereignly bring into salvation, open the eyes of people to see their need for Jesus. That is what drives me. That has to be the most important thing in the life of this church, that we make disciples who make disciples, that the gospel is paramount. Like Tony Morita, who is a professor at Southwestern Seminary, a church planner in North Carolina, and a personal friend, writes this in one of his books. He says, The gospel is about love. Therefore, we should be known as a loving people. The gospel is about justice. Therefore, we should be a justice-seeking people. The gospel is about life. Therefore, we should display visible vitality and joy in our gatherings and in our relationships. The gospel is about liberty. Therefore, we should not live as stuffy legalists. The gospel is about humility. Therefore, we should be humble people, gladly serving others we should be about the gospel and everything the gospel is about why because it's the gospel that forgave us so that we could forgive it's the gospel that was shown us mercy so that we can show mercy it's the gospel that showed us patience so that we can show patience you see our job is to reflect the gospel in all that we do. We contend together for the gospel. Why? Because we're in one accord and we're led by the Spirit. Now, let me tell you something that's good that Paul puts in here. He says, don't be afraid because when you're unified, you can't lose. See, when you're unified in the gospel, the gospel always wins. Why? The cross and the resurrection. We've already won. We've already won. So we live as victorious people with the goal of sharing that victory with others. Why? Because we want others to live victorious and joyous as well. I wrote that in my notes on Tuesday before the election result was done. And I'm like, I got to make sure that I I remind our people because I had no idea what type of environment I'll be coming in to preach on today. But it doesn't matter that President-elect Trump won. If it had been the other way around, the truth of that statement would not change. We, as followers of Jesus, invited to sit at the table we still win because the gospel has won for 
us. Amen. Number two, a unified table is a joyful place to sit around. A unified table is a joyful place to sit around. Listen, have you ever, have you ever been to a family meal? And these usually happen at family meals where you're excited to be with your family and then somebody brings up something stupid. <laughs> Politics, sports, whatever, right? They bring up something stupid and all of a sudden the meal just doesn't taste as good and you really, you're ready to leave and it's just, it's bad. Not this table. Not God's people. Because when we gather around this table, when we come together corporately, when we come in our small groups on Sunday morning or, or our men's and women's Bible studies on Monday or Tuesday or whenever we gather, it should be a joyful occasion. Why? We are with brothers and sisters in Christ. You see, at, at this table, that's all you are, your brothers and sisters. You see, you don't see race here. There are no white Christians or black Christians or Hispanic Christians or whatever. There are Christians. There are brothers and sisters in Christ. We don't see gender. I see brothers and sisters in Christ. We, we don't see a, a nationality. Why? Because what defines us is what Christ has done in us and what Christ has called us to do together. There is nowhere in Scripture that you see a hyphenated Christianity. We are in one accord. We may be from different countries of origin. Doesn't matter. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're different genders, male or female. That's it. Very clear. Not my rules. That's God's rules. That's how He created it. Take it up with Him. You got a problem with that. But we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Common ground at the cross that saved both. I care less what the color of your skin is. Are you a brother? Or are you a sister in Christ? Because that's what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about leading a table of believers, looking at the lordship of Jesus, who are focused on the gospel. What a beautiful thing to look out into an audience and see people from all different nations, tribes, and tongues. Sounds like heaven. That is something that we must celebrate. Never, ever, ever, ever should that be a point of division, but should be a point of celebration. Because if it's a point of division in your life, I want you to check your heart because there's something not right. You're really, 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 really going to be disappointed in heaven. Because God has called a church of every nation, tribe, and tongue. All of us not worthy to sit at the table. But yet God in His sovereign mercy and grace invites us to sit here. So when the main thing is the main thing, the fellowship is sweet and joyful because Christ is the focus of our attention. Listen, when, when our focus is on the lordship and headship of Christ, when He is the reason why we gather in our groups, in our corporate worship time, it can only be joyful. It can only bring us happiness. It's when our eyes get on one another or outside of the table that it poisons the joyfulness of being together. Number three, a unified table is stronger because of the diversity of its parts. If we, all had, if we were all tabletops and no legs, how functional of a table would that be? Or if we were all legs with no tabletop, how functional a table would that be? You see, a strong table, a strong church is made up of many parts so that when they are working together, they create a strong, functional, and durable force that can accomplish anything the Lord has for it to accomplish. Listen, I am glad that not everybody's like me. And I'm glad that everybody is not like you. I am glad that we are different, that God has gifted us differently. He's given us different passions. He's given us different talents. We bring all of that together to the table. And all of a sudden, we have a strong, functional, usable ministry of expanding the gospel 
of Jesus Christ. And some of you, what you need to do is get yourself involved in being part of the table. Whether you are already in membership here, but you're not serving somewhere, or maybe you've been visiting for a while and God is leading you to this church, you need to say yes to that this morning and come join our fellowship, go through our membership class in January, and then put yourself to work at doing what God has called you to do. I need a church of people that will come around, join me, join us, and let's go out and make a difference in our region. And there's plenty of places for you to use how you're gifted and how you're passionate. And we need every single one of you, regardless of your age or regardless of what you physically think you can or can't do anymore. There are some of you, you spent decades teaching the Bible here at Northlake and serving, but now you're at an age where you can't do much anymore, but you know what you can do? You can pray. You can pray. Some of you, you can't go on mission trips anymore, but you can give to somebody else to go. God has blessed you financially, and you can say, listen, hey, pastor, I can sponsor somebody 100%, or I can, I can write a check for a certain amount. I want to help our students and leaders go to West Virginia in June. I want to help the team that's going to Alaska in July. I want to help whatever other mission opportunities we have. Some of you, you can carry boxes to a car and volunteer in our food pantry. Some of you, you can hold a baby and play with a child on Sunday mornings once a month or once a quarter. So we have adequate and safe child care for those parents who choose to take advantage of that at our church. There's a place for you to serve, regardless of your age, regardless of your physical abilities. You can serve and be an honor to the Lord, and we need you to do that. Go back to Philippians chapter 2, you pick up, go back to verse 3, and it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we are a church that is unified. But we are also a church that is humble. We are a church that is humble. And we, we live out our humbleness when we recognize that we've been invited to sit at the table, not awarded a seat at the table. Okay, you've been invited. If you're in Christ, Christ has invited you to the table. You have received that invitation. You have had this place at the table, but you've not been awarded a seat at the table. You see, if I've been awarded a seat at the table, then that means I have done something to earn that seat. You've done nothing to earn the seat at the table. All you and I have earned with our own righteousness and our own suspected goodness that we believe we have is separation from God for all eternity. Our sinfulness has awarded us hell for eternity. But God in His mercy and in His kindness and in His grace invites us to the table. So it's an invitation to the table. It's not an award. You've not done anything to earn it. If I've not done something to earn my seat, then my seat is no longer a gift. If I have to earn it, it's not a gift. If, if my seat is something that's awarded to me, it's no longer a gift. A gift is something that is given freely. It's given without strings attached. If it's no longer a gift, it's no longer grace. If my seat at the table is not a gift, then it's no longer grace. And if it's no longer grace, then I am sitting at a counterfeit table being hosted by a counterfeit God. Let that sink in for a moment. If you feel like that you have done something, even if it's on the only you know, minuscule amount 
of something to earn your place in God's kingdom, you are sitting at a counterfeit table looking at a counterfeit God. Because the Bible is clear that all you and I have done, the righteousness that we have is a filthy rag before God. The wages of our sin is death. But God, who is rich in mercy, invites us to the table, gifts us with his grace to sit at the table for all of eternity. You see, the most humble person out in the world should be us Christians. There should not be an arrogant follower of Jesus out there. None of us should be out there arrogant as if, yes, I am a Christian. It should be, let me tell you something, there is nothing about me that deserves the love of God. But God in his mercy richly loved me and he wants to richly love you. And we call sinners to repentance and trust that Jesus will open their eyes and they'll see their need for him. But may we never be boastful about ourselves, but may we only ever boast in the Christ who saved us. We should always be humble. Number two, we live out our humbleness and we use the power to serve others and not to exploit others. You see, when we're followers of Jesus, our responsibility is to serve other people. So even in positions of authority, which many of us find ourselves in our homes, in our jobs, even in the church, our responsibility is to serve other people. That should make us distinct in our homes, in our workplaces, and in the church. Heck, it should be natural in the church, but sometimes we have to be reminded that our objective is to serve other people. See, Jesus, Paul gives the example of Jesus, he says, existing in the form of God, which means one who possessed inwardly and displayed outwardly the very nature of God. We, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Again, you can go back to week two of this series where we talked about the person of Christ and how Christ is both 100% God and 100% man. That he did not give up his divine nature when he came to earth. That he remained 100% God. But that he considered, Paul said, or he regarded that, that, that position, which meant he calculated, he added up the needs. When he regarded his position as God, when he, the concern of his deity, when he, when he considered his deity... He calculated it. And he said, basically, look, I look at the needs of the people for a Savior, and I will take my needs and I will put them aside. And I will leave the throne of heaven, and I will take on flesh. I will take on a human nature with my divine nature, and I will come. And then Paul says that he didn't consider equality with God something to be exploited. In other words, he voluntarily suppressed parts of his divinity. He was still God, but he chose not to use his divinity at times while he was on earth. He could have called 10,000 angels to take him off the cross and to level everything, but he didn't. He was God. He could have chosen not to be thirsty not to be hungry, not to be tired. But he chose to identify with us. Why? That as we, as broken and frail humans, could look at a Savior in the Scriptures and see if he can be other, so can I. Which is why so many times in the Gospels you see Jesus saying, I am only doing what my Father tells me to do. I am about my Father's business. Do you see that everything that Jesus did was about the Father? So that when we look at Jesus' life, we mimic His actions, that everything that we are about is about Jesus because He was about the Father's business. 
And he did that for us. And Paul says that he took on the form of a servant. And really, that should be better translated a bond servant, which is someone who chooses to be under the authority of someone else. Jesus took on human flesh. He took on humanity. And he became a bond servant, a servant to humanity. He chose to do that for us. And the implication or the application for us is that we should put others first. That when we concentrate on taking care of the needs of the house, when we make sure that everyone's needs are met, the house is joyful, the house is happy, the house is content. But when needs aren't met or we begin to become me-centered, instead of Christ-focused and other-centered. There's dissension, there's division, there's disruption, and then eventually there's disintegration. That will not be this body. That will not be this table. You have wrestled and suffered long enough through trials and tribulations dealing with that. We will be Unified because our eyes will be on Jesus. We will be focused on the gospel and we will come together to see God's will done in this house and in our community. You see, you cannot humble yourself before the Lord if you're simultaneously seeking to elevate yourself above others. We need people who are servants. We need leaders who are servants. Who will say, how do we take our responsibility and we make the gospel here in the church the primary way? When we're watching children. How do we make the gospel primary? When we're working with our students, how do we make the gospel primary? When we're teaching adults, how do we make the gospel primary? When we're handing out boxes of food on Saturday, which, y'all, this past week, 110 boxes of food. 110 gospel touch points that our church made this week. How do we take everything that we do and make sure the gospel is the center of it? Number three, we live out humbleness when we allow God to exalt us. We live out humbleness when we allow God to to exalt us. You see there in the passage that it was God who exalted the Son. That God who said, I will make his name the greatest name. That I will make his name above all names. <clears throat> and here's the deal as God works in the life of us individually, as God works in the life of our church, may it be said of those on the outside when they look at what goes on here on the inside. They say, there is something that God is doing there. I cannot explain it. But God's hand of favor is on that church. If you look at my prayer journal, <clears throat> in the section that I'm praying over our church, there's a line there that says, I pray for favor in our community. Every morning as I pray, I pray that God gives our church favor with those who live around us, with our neighbors, with our friends that they would not drive by this place or come by this place and have a negative thought about it, but God would grant us favor with those people. That they would see this as a place that when they're hungry, they can come and get food. When they're in need of counseling, they can come and receive pastoral counseling. When they need a family to be a part of, they can come and be a part of a family. And I pray that's your prayer as well. But the Father exalts the Son. As followers of Jesus, our mission is to live in such a way that even if no credit on this earth for the things we do for others or the way we live, even if we get no credit for that, the moment we enter eternity, we hear the words, well done by the Father. It's almost like we're children who get done eating their meal the parents look at their plate and they say, wow, you made a happy plate. Good job. 
I want the Father to look at me when I enter into heaven and look at me and say, Son, well done. Well done. You were obedient. And where you weren't obedient, the grace that my son gives covered your disobedience. All I see is my son. Oh, what a day that'll be. J.I. Packer, wonderful theologian, pastor, author. In his book, Your Father Loves You, writes this. He quotes a few passages. 1 Corinthians 15, 9, he says, I am the least of the apostles. He quotes Paul again in Ephesians 3, 8, I am the very least of all saints. And then again in 1 Timothy 1, 15, he quotes Paul saying, I am the foremost of sinners. Humility and passion for praise are pair or a pair of characteristics which together indicate growth in grace. The Bible is full of self-humbling men bowing down before God and doxology, which is man giving praise to God. The healthy heart is one that bows down in humility and rises in praise and adoration. The Psalms strike both these notes again and again. So too, Paul in his letters both articulates humility and breaks into doxology. Look at these descriptions of himself quoted above, the ones I mentioned, dating respectively from around A.D. 59 to then A.D. 63 to A.D. 64. As the years pass, he goes lower. Least of the apostles, very least of the saints, foremost of sinners. He grows downward. And as his self-esteem sinks, so his rapture of praise and adoration for God, who is so wonderfully saved, him rises. Undoubtedly, learning to praise God at all times for all that is good is a mark that we will, are growing in grace. One of my predecessors in my first parochial appointment died exceedingly painful death of cancer. But between fearful bouts of agony in which he had to stuff his mouth with bedcloths to avoid biting his tongue, he would say aloud over and over again, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be on my mouth. That's Psalm 34.1. What that was a passion of praise asserting itself in the most poignant extremity, extremity imaginable. Cultivate humility and a passion for praise if you want to grow in grace. This morning, I hope that you have seen that as a church, we will be a church that is unified in the gospel and for the gospel. We'll also be a church that is humble. Because that's what the Father told us we have to be. This morning, I hope that maybe someone in this room, you've realized that you've never truly placed your faith in Christ and that this morning you understand your need for a Savior. That you can't earn your way to the table, but that Jesus has paid the price for you and He invites you to come because of His love and His grace and His mercy towards you. This morning, if that's you, and in a moment we're going to have a response time. When the song begins, would you come and share that with me? Perhaps you've been visiting our church, and you need a church to belong to. You need a table to call your own. And you've heard the heart of this pastor. You've sensed the heart of this fellowship, and this is where God wants you to be. Would you come and share that with me? Would you come and announce that you'd like to be a part of this table, serving the Lord in this community to reach this region for Christ? Maybe there's something else that you need to deal with. Whether you want to deal with that in your seat, you want to come to the front and pray, however you want to do that, would you respond as the Spirit is leading you? Remember, that's key. The Spirit leads us so we are obedient to what the Spirit tells us to do. Heavenly Father, this morning I pray that, Lord, whatever you have in store for us with decisions that will be made, God, I pray that whatever decisions are made, whether publicly or privately, that God, they're responding to the leading of the Holy Spirit. 
And that, God, we walk out of this place joyful because we're with brothers and sisters in Christ. And we are unified in the gospel. And we're humble because we realize that every chair that we occupy around the table of, of God is not awarded to us, but it's an invitation that God graciously gave us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing. As we come to you to receive the food of your holy word, take your truth planted deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the light of Christ may be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith speak O lord and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory teach us lord full obedience holy Test our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your purity. Cause our faith to rise, cause our eyes to see your majestic love and authority. Words of power that can never fail let their truth prevail over unbelief amen i might invite you guys to be seated but emil to come up as our boys as our men young men are passing the plate uh emil wants to come and share some things with the church As many of you know, tomorrow is Veterans Day. It is a national holiday honoring the veterans who served in all of our armed forces, as well as those who were killed in this country's too many wars. The observation originated in 1919 at the end of World War I, known as Armistice Day. In 1920, an unknown soldier was interred in Westminster Abbey and at the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. The following year, in 1921, the United States buried an unknown soldier from World War I at Arlington National Cemetery. Unfortunately, it was not the only one to end up there. November the 11th became a national holiday in the U.S. in 1938. In 1954, the name was changed to Veterans Day. Ceremonies are held at the Tomb of the Unknown. Floral tributes and flags are placed on the graves of veterans in many cemeteries and memorials. Naturalization ceremonies have become a practice honored and held on Veterans Day. Those of you who are veterans, you have helped make this world a better place with your courage, your sacrifice, and your dedication to our country. No words could ever express how much that means to all of the people in the United States. Thank you for all you did and for all you're doing. If you are a veteran with us today, I would ask you to please stand.
Thank you. I w please remain standing. Please remain standing. I would ask that if you are a spouse of a veteran who cannot be here today, whether they are uh, infirmed, past, or, or otherwise, just not here, if you would also join them in standing. You too have suffered and given a lot. I would ask if the students among us would come forward. We've got a little gift for the veterans that we would ask that you uh, help us hand these out. Please remain standing until you have received your gift. Thank you. Pastor Corey. Let me pray one more time for our, our veterans. Father, again, we thank you for the men and women who have uh, sacrificed so much the families that go with those men and women who um, perhaps for months or even years go without seeing their loved one because of deployment. For the many men and women who are deployed now, Lord, we pray for their families who are here. God, for the anxiety and the worry that may be in those families, we pray in Jesus' name that you would cover those families, that you would protect them. For our men and women who are in active battle zones, God, we pray your protection upon them. Or for the chaplains who share the word of Jesus each, each day, that we pray for them that they would be bold, that, God, we would continue to see men and women come to faith in Jesus within our military. Lord, we thank you for these men and women. They help undergird and keep America the place that it is. Lord, we know above and beyond all that, Lord, it's your sovereign hand of mercy that is on us, and we do not neglect that one bit. All again, we thank you for these men and women. God, may they be honored for the service that they have given. In Jesus' name, amen. Real quick before we leave, uh, a couple things. Number one, our Trail Life guys are selling uh, smoked Boston butts, all right? So if you need a meat that you don't want to cook for Thanksgiving, there's a few tickets left. Brian Hunter, Brian, raise your hand. Kerry Whitlow is somewhere. He's in the back. Um, so they get front and back, all right? So you can come and, uh, and, and get those tickets if you want that. They'll be ready for you. Um, and he can give you uh, information on that. Um, in your bulletin, another practical way for you to serve others. While you're out shopping, grab some extra sugar. Flour. We're going to try to add these during the holidays for our, uh, our food pantry baskets. Uh, men, no Bible study tomorrow night. So I know it says in there that we are meeting, but we're not meeting tomorrow night. And then just to remind you, uh, the money management series, you, these are one-off, so you don't have to be enrolled in FPU. All right, if, if any of these fit your schedule and the the topic is something you're interested in please 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 plan to be here on on that wednesday night to be a part of that uh this uh, thursday sunshiners lunch uh i'm looking forward to that even if no one else is amen uh september 17th that night listen we're going to be presenting our operational budget for the next calendar year november the 17th what did i say September. No, if you come in September, we're probably not going to be doing that then. We're working on the next year's budget. The, November the 17th, 6 p.m. in this room, 
uh, we're going to lay out our operational budget for next year and kind of give you a glimpse into uh, where we're heading as a church. And so we want you to be here for that. And then a special night of worship the next Sunday night, the 24th, 6 p.m. Our worship uh, and choir ministry has been putting together a wonderful night for us. And uh, just come, we're going to adore Jesus and at a moment of thanksgiving that night as a worship time. Many other things. And if you know of a veteran who's not here and would like to take them a bag, Wanda has additional bags. They'll be over there at the door and at this door here. Feel free to please grab a bag, bring it to a veteran that you know, a neighbor, a family member, whoever it might be. All right, Tim Hurley is our deacon of the week. He'll come and close us out in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for our great veterans all across the country and around the world that uh, saved us from a time so that we might be a people, a people that is generous and a people that love God. Father, I lift up all these prayers for all of those. But also, Father, let us not forget as we leave this church building that we all have a faith story to tell about our encounter with Jesus. May we go out and share with others that we might lift them up, that they might know the grace of God in their hearts. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen.